this is such an amazing um, thing that you have here in Australia, Australian Christian Lobby. When I first heard about it, um, when I came and met Peter and, and have seen over the years what you do, I was amazed at the strength of this movement. Um, I think it's amazing how people from all different churches and all different backgrounds come together and just um, fight for what is right and what is true. And, and I think that it's such a great strength in that unity. And I'm very honored to be here. So like Peter said, I've had three babies the last seven years. So I've been busy taking care of them. About seven years ago, we moved here as a family. And, and in Sweden, I knew very well what I felt like God was calling me to do. Uh, and I worked with an organization that works very similar to the um, Human Rights Alliance here. Um, and so when we came here, I was a bit unsure of what the purpose of that was. Um, but as time has gone by, I, I feel like God has been showing me an arena, an area in Australia that, that needs to change. And I really believe it will. Um, I, we love Australia so much as a family. I think even before we moved here, I loved Australia as a kid already. I think Swedes generally do. Um, but I, just, I think that Australia has this amazing opportunity to take a lead on fighting human trafficking and on changing the laws on the sex industry and the prostitution industry. Um, and it's a, it's a unique role that Australia has because we can change laws in Europe, but say in Europe is positioned in a way that they will always have the influx of so much people because of how it's just located globally. Whereas Australia actually has a chance with the right laws to show the world how we can do this really well. And so I'm hoping that one day I'll get to see that happen. Um, see if this clicker will work for me now. Um, is it working? Uh, this is actually not my presentation. <laughs> there we go. All right. Perfect. There we go. Okay. So I wanted to talk. My, I've named my topic, Laws to Fight Sex Trafficking and to Shape Culture. Because through our laws, we shape our culture. And I know everyone in here knows that, but I will talk a little bit about it anyways. Um, I think sometimes we forget how much our laws shape the way we think. Um, if, if it's legal to drive and read on your phone, people generally will do it. And then we change our laws, and then first people are upset. But then some things happen, and some big accidents happen, and media report on how the person was actually looking on their phone, and suddenly people's mentali mentality starts to change. And a few years down the track, people think differently about that. And, and that's what we have the power to do through our laws and our legal systems. And so I really just think we need to be so careful in how we shape them and how we will shape our culture. And so um, I want to talk about today a little bit on the truth of Australia actually having sex trafficking and the reality of that in our nation. And um, I think oftentimes when we hear sex trafficking, we think of other nations. But the truth is we have sex trafficking here in Australia. Um, Get it to work. Keep clicking. Keep clicking. All right. This is tricky. Can someone change it for me? All right. Perfect. All right. So um, I've said human trafficking is a reality in Australia, and I want to start with a little story that I um, uh, that I well an experience that I had recently. I was in Sydney. And um, I was there for a conference, and I stayed at a, at a main street in Sydney called George Street, close to the harbour. And, um, and I had a bit of a season when I was questioning what's going to be next for me. My kids are getting a little bit older, the youngest one is starting kindy, and so I will have a little bit more time. And I was feeling like maybe God was challenging me to, to uh, do some more in this area, but I was kind of trying to wiggle myself out of it, if that makes sense. <laughs> and so I had said to God, this trip you'll have to speak to me, I need some confirmation. And as I stepped into our hotel room and I opened the windows, the room across from mine on the other side of the street was a brothel. And, um, and it was one of those brothels that many people probably wouldn't even know it was a brothel. It had a massage sign down on, on the front door and you could see dirty sheets hanging in front of the windows. And it was really just 
very, very offensive and, and hard sight to see. And I just could not stop looking at this place. And during the whole time I was there, I saw girls coming out to that, that room, which would have been the kitchen, but I never saw anyone leave. And so even in early in the mornings when we went out to get breakfast, never, no one left. Lunch, no one left. Evening, it was still people there and the, the light switch were blinking. And I've heard these things. I've heard that this is a reality in Australia. But these girls did not rock up with the coffee in their hand in the morning in their car to go to work. They lived there. And they were not Australian. They were from an Asian country. Um, and as I looked down the street, I saw house after house after house after house with these um, massage parlors and, and so on and so forth. And, and one night, particularly, we walked home. And um, I will never, ever forget this experience. So I was walking and talking to my friends, and we didn't even realize where we entered into, that we had come to that area. And my eyes met the eyes of this beautiful young girl. And as she met my eyes, her face looked down in shame. And I only then realized that she was standing outside of one of these massage parlor places and, and holding a sign in her hand saying $20. And so this young girl was standing there very ashamed and, and vulnerable, holding a sign, selling herself for $20 in our nation. And, and that got to me. I couldn't sleep that whole night. I've heard about this before, but I've never seen it like that. And I think I knew then that this just cannot go on. This cannot happen. And I hope after this talk today, you will realize why that was in Sydney today that that's happening and, and also what we need to do about it. And so if we can <coughs> change our uh, slide again there. The United Nations has pointed out Australia as one of 21 trafficking destination countries which falls in the high destination category. And this often gets a little bit of a, oh wow, because we don't hear enough yeah. about this. And the reason for that is that it's all covered under a beautiful, absolutely not beautiful, but um, it's covered under this, this secret blanket of prostitution, where we don't see the reality of what's actually going on, because this is an industry that we don't necessarily encounter that much, unless you would be you know, late at night in an area like what I just described. If we look at how we are located, if we change to the next slide, um, we can see that we are close to the biggest region for human trafficking in the world. This is the International Labour Organization's statistics. And we see 12 million victims about that amount. And this is obviously very ish figures. But we know that Asia Pacific is a massive region. And we don't know the numbers in Australia. We only know that the TIP report that comes out every year has said that why is Australia not doing anything to prosecute traffickers. We know there's trafficking in Australia. What's going on? And so we have this critique directed towards our nation. Um, and, and I think the politicians are starting to see this and it's becoming an area politically that we are starting to deal with. But it's more about how Australia can prevent human trafficking outside of Australia. And I really think we need to look at how do we change our laws inside Australia so we can take a lead and show the world how this can be done well. Um, the next one, I've written that prostitution is the doorway to sex trafficking. And um, um, the, there's basically two ways of regulating prostitution in the world today. Um, one of them is what you probably most of you know about, it's the legalizing prostitution. And then the other side is criminalizing prostitution. But when we say that, usually people think of putting prostitutes in prison. And that's never worked really well, obviously, because these people are always, like what we heard from earlier, um, we, that these people are vulnerable and they are in need of help and they are um, struggling, obviously, with post-traumatic stress disorder and all sorts of different challenges if they will ever come out of the industry. And so um, we need to look at, so, so that's not been working very well. But there's another way of also criminalizing prostitution where we say, no, what we're going to do instead is we're going to look at what drives this industry, what makes it worse. And then we look at the demand. And so instead of, of prosecuting the prostitutes, we'll prosecute the buyers. Because when we prosecute the buyers, we speak something, we say something to the society that you are doing something that is wrong. 
And by saying that enough, over time, we change the way people think. And so that's another way of dealing with prostitution that's been very successful. And I will speak more about it towards the end of my speech. Um, first, I want to just dwell a little bit on legalizing and the effects of legalizing. And so um, there's a big debate going on, especially here in Australia, whether we should legalize or what we should do. And, and sadly, it tends to lean towards legalizing. And I'm yet to understand why, but I think I know a little bit of the voices that are pushing that and where they're coming from. And it was very um, informative. It was very good to hear your, your speech as well, Dr. Taylor, um, on this. Um, but there is a big debate going on. And, and I just want to point us to um, some other places in the world. So the European Parliament has said that the most co conservative statistics suggest that one in seven prostitutes in Europe are victims of trafficking, but the police in the Netherlands where prostitution has been legalized estimate that between 60 and 90 percent of prostitution, prostitutes are victims of trafficking. That's a huge number and that is from the police. And, and I know Peter can testify to this because he's been there and he's seen these areas. And um, so this has gone a little bit out of control in the Netherlands and um, the police will say so and many politicians too. Um, because when you, when you legalize, you say something to the public. What you do is you actually take away a little bit of that factor of bad conscience. You tell them that, you know what, we're going to make this safe. We're going to try and make it as good as possible for these people in prostitution. Because that's generally the reason that politicians want to legalize. They say that we want to give these people um, social insurance. We want to give them safe, that we want to make the brothels safe. We want to make sure they're taken care of and, and they have exit programs. But in, for what sort of normal job do you need an exit program? And, and, and the truth is that when, what happens when we say that is that we tell the general public that you can go and buy sex now, you can buy another human being who's actually inherently not wanting this. So you buy prostitution in itself is is not consenting, buying someone, paying someone who really doesn't want to have sex with you to do it because they need the money. So the consent is gone there. And so we're saying that this is okay and this is a job like no others. And so we're speaking this to the public. And, uh, and that changes the way people act. And over time this becomes part of the culture and it grows and demand spikes. And so um, in Queensland, where prostitution and brothels are legal, the Crime and Misconduct Commission has stated that sex trafficking appears to be one of the unfortunate consequences of an industry driven by excessive demand. So this might explain what I saw in Sydney, if that makes sense. I saw that with my own eyes when I went there. I had heard about it. I heard Peter speak about it and I had read about it, but I saw it. And, and I think as you ha hope that as you've heard this, that you will start seeing the blinking massage signs as well and realize what they actually are. Because they are out there everywhere. But they are out there even more in the states that have clearly legalized prostitution. Um, so um, we can change. And I've written here, when we legalize, we normalize. And when we normalize, demand spikes. And when demand spikes, where do all these sex workers come from? And it's just a good short phrase of what I'm trying to say. I think if, if you want to remember something, remember that. Uh, Germany, we can change, uh, legalized in 2000. Um, it's now known as the brothel of Europe. Um, it's led to a massive increase in demand. Of the estimated 400,000 prostitutes and 1 million clients per day, only 44 sex workers are covered by social insurance. It never works to legalize prostitution. This is an arena that is organized and kept by organized crime and it doesn't change by legalizing it. It's not a job like any other. It's exploitation, it's violence, it's trafficking. Um, and we need to see the true face of prostitution and we need to help others see the true face of prostitution. Um, women that come out of prostitution and come to Sweden where we have this other approach um, where we say that it's, we're going to target demand and so we made it illegal to buy sex. 
they say that they testify of more violence in legal brothels because sex workers that feel that they are enti or sex buyers that feel like they are entitled to what they want have they act worse than those that know that they're already committing a crime doing what they're doing they will be more careful and try and stay out of spotlight if that makes sense and if we look at the Netherlands next Organized crime has kept control of the industry and the situation is deemed out of control by authorities. Former mayor of Amsterdam, Job Cohen, has said that this is no longer about small scale entrepreneurs, but those big crime organizations are involved here in trafficking women, drugs, killings and other criminal activities. So what we do when we legalize is actually giving the organized crime a great money cow. Because who knows, you can sell drugs once, and you can sell weapons once, but you can sell a person over and over and over and over for a lifetime. And so it's a very lucrative business for organized crime. And so the police in nations that have a different system, they say that when we changed the laws, we saw that that changed and broke the back of lots of this cr crime industry that we see. They don't have the same foothold anymore. And it's not really worth for them to come and do what they're doing because they just don't make enough money and so they'll go to other nations where it's easier. Does that make sense? So we'll look at the next one as well. In 2014, the Council of Europe did a large inquiry into the effects of legalizing prostitution and they came to the conclusion that legalization has proven ineffective, unable to either work, protect the victims involved or to break the ties between prostitution and organized crime. And so these statistics all have references, and if you need them, you can email, I guess, Peter or me. I don't have my email address up here today, but um, you can come and find me afterwards. And this will be available on YouTube as well, from what I understand. Um, so there are some inquiries that have been made. There has been, there's actually great proof. And so it's very strange how we're still leaning towards legalizing. Um, Australia right now is at a crossroads and, and if we look at this next map, we can go on one more actually, um, the next one there is a map of Australia and we see that the green parts is where prostitution is already legalized um, and that's why I saw what I saw, it's been going on for a while. Um, but the blue part still hasn't really made up their minds. Sadly, the Northern Territory and South Australia is very close to introducing bills on legalizing prostitution from what I've understood. But there's some great advocates in both states that are trying to speak the truth of this and hopefully, prayerfully, it won't go through. Either way, I do think that the truth speaks the loudest, loudest. I know in Victoria now they're having such issues and problems that they're now looking at changing into the better way. Um, I think the Liberal Party has adopted the Nordic approach as their <laughs> political, um, like that's what's, yeah, policy. Thank you. <laughs> Second language challenges. Uh, um, yeah, but let's look at the Nordic approach on prostitution. Uh, if we change the slide again there. Um, in 99, Sweden was the first country to change its laws to say that we're never going to think that it's okay to buy another human being for sex. We want to see the sex trade for what it is. It's inherently unequal. And it's, it's people in need of money, in vulnerable situations, having to come to this place where they're getting exploited by other people that are rich, men usually, um, that are rich and exploiting these women, which is usually the case as well. Um, the bill was part of a government bill on violence against women and prostitution was seen as a form of violence on women. And it was seen as something that will influence the culture and the nation and the way we think about each other in a bad way. Um, because if, if prostitution is okay, if we as a government say that it's okay to buy someone else for sex, how will that influence the way that we think of each other? And how will it influence our culture? <laughs> And so we need to say that, no, this is never going to be okay, and we want, to, we want the buyers to know that they're committing a crime when they're buying someone for sex. And what they're actually doing is they're enhancing trafficking and they're putting money into organized crime. So we want to teach them that. And so um, the Nordic approach soon led to street prostitution was, was reduced to 50% in just a few weeks. Today, you will not find a brothel in clear sight anywhere in Sweden. And um, 
that is amazing because what it does is it changes the public's opinion. And so I actually tested this on a few friends that are absolutely not Christian, very politically correct in every arena, every area. And, and I just thought, I'm going to try it on them. So I said, did you know that there's actually brothels here in Australia? And they were shocked. And to them, straight away, they thought trafficking. And so, and I, I think oftentimes, because prostitution has been part of society here for a long time, we think of it as something that's just here and just has to be here. But it doesn't, and we can change this. Um, and so it led to a big change in culture. And in Sweden, the law um, led to attitudes changing. And today, most people support the ban, especially young people are very positive to it. Um, it makes, makes a clear statement about respect for women and gender equality. And it's just, it's as simple as lower demand, less prostitution, less trafficking. Yeah? Um, here, next one, you can actually go down two slides now. Um, here, this guy here, his name is Simon Hegstrom, and he's the head of the Stockholm Police Prostitution Unit, and he's the author of several books, one called Shadow Law, the true story of, of a Swedish detective inspector fighting prostitution. This is a really exciting novel, and very good novel. Um, this is an amazing guy. He just has dedicated his life to fight this. And I actually wrote down a quote from him here. Uh, he posts a lot on social media, and he reaches hundreds and thousands of people through these avenues. And, in just, and then he, he posted one thing like this. In just a few seconds, another man will be arrested for buying sex. Many of these that we arrest think that the police must have better things to do to stop these buyers from investing their money right into organized crime and stopping them from shattering young women's lives is apparently not something that is important in their eyes. Me and my colleagues will keep up our work. And while Sweden is watching the finals of Let's Dance, we're out here ready to bring bitter consequence to all those choosing to use women's vulnerable situation for their own short pleasure. Sorry. Yeah, so through these kind of initiatives, can you see what I'm, where, where I'm coming with this? We're changing the way people think and we're teaching them something. And it's the truth about what prostitution is. And so um, today the Council of Europe, uh, we can change, uh, recommends all its member states to adopt the Nordic approach on prostitution. And many countries have followed. Israel is the latest, I think, and then Canada, Norway, Iceland, Peter will tell you, <laughs> France. Um, a lot of countries have changed into this and have amazing results when they have. Um, and now the Council of Europe has recommended, like I said, its member states to change as well. I know a few states in the US are, are bringing in similar laws, maybe not exactly the same, but they're looking at this and trying to follow the example. And so this is spreading and it's definitely the way that we need to go. And so um, I put here, you know, it's, it can be frustrating some, sometimes when you see statistics like this and it seems so evident and so obvious that why is this not already happening? Why, has, why have we not done this already? But, you know, I really think that when truth is told clearly and well, um, you know, at the end, when we don't give up, we will, we, I, I do believe we can see it succeed. We've seen it now in nation after nation, how they change. And so we just need to really be persistent. And in our prayers as well, you know, really pray for this area because I do think it's like a, I don't know what the word for it, but it's just, it's an area that influences our culture negatively. And Australia is such a beautiful nation with such beautiful people. And um, if we see change in this area, we will see ripple effects in other areas as well. Um, what can we do? You know, first of all, I really think we need to get good at calling the police when we see things. Even when you see these dodgy massage places, because what happens now is we actually don't call them. And so they don't have, they will just tell you a lot of, well, not, not the police that actually know, but a lot of people just say, well, there is no trafficking. We have no trafficking. Because if you walk up and, and ask a young woman in one of these brothels, are you trafficked? She will not tell you yes, for whatever reason, she's never there. She's, she's, the prison walls that they are bound behind are not of you know, physical prison walls. They're, they're there by threat, by fear, by shame. There's all these sorts of reasons. Poverty is a massive thing as well. 
And so they won't just say yes. And so police needs to be educated and needs to be trained in how to help them. We need to have great exit programs that help them when they need to come out. Um, and so, but definitely, you know, by starting to actually reporting these things, the more that pile grows on the police's desk, the more they will have to look into this. Um, and then you can sign up at the .nordic WA webpage, um, which with Peter Betts and Caitlin Roper and, and me and some other amazing people <laughs> that try and make a change here. Um, and you can write a letter to your local MP. And that's actually probably the, one of the most important things. And um, <coughs> we, will, we have letter templates already written up for you. Maybe we can add them onto the YouTube clip or, or just kind of somehow make sure people get a hold of that. Um, so you can just copy and put your own words into it and then just write to your MP so that this becomes something that they see regularly because then they will f hopefully eventually see the truth of it and bring it up. Um, another thing that you can do is you can join Walk for Freedom and uh, we can move on. <laughs> um, every year, this year on October the 19th, we're doing a walk around our city. Um, it's with an organization called A21's Abolish Slavery in the 21st Century. And um, they do an amazing job. It was originally founded by Christine Kane. And now on that date, all around the world, these walks appear in the big cities. And I think it's over 500 walks in 500 cities and over 60 um, countries represented. And um, I've been hosting this walk now for two years. And after second year, after last year, I was quite tired because I'm doing all this and taking care of my family and trying to study PhD on, on this as well. Um, so I wasn't sure and I was questioning whether it was important. And I was almost thinking about maybe not doing it again. Um, and then through this year, God's just been showing me that even more than these walks, they do raise public awareness because when hundreds and hundreds of people, last year we were over 400 people, walk quietly in a silent line with t-shirts saying slavery still exists and abolish slavery with each step through our city, it's hard to say that slavery doesn't exist. Um, but more than that, their spiritual declar declaration, and I think that's what God's been showing me this year, it's that it matters that we walk around our city and just pray for it and claim it and, and just push back those forces of darkness that are really the maybe truth of what is pushing this so hard in our nation. Um, and so to just um, conclude in the last slide, um, I just want to say our laws shape our culture. Let's remember that and let's work on um, changing them so that we change our culture. And then it should never be regarded as okay to buy someone for sex. Um, because those trapped in the sex industry, they suffer tremendously, and they always will. It will never be a safe area for anyone to be in. And it won't be something that people make want to do by choice. It's, it's something that you choose from desperation. Um, and from being lured into it, given you know, false ideas of what it actually is. The organized crime, holds the prostitution industry in its grip. And they're not kind people. And then um, I've said that Australia can really take a lead in fighting sex trafficking in Asia Pacific and shaping a culture that understands the true face of prostitution. And you know, Australia, because of the way we're positioned, like I said, if we were to change our laws, we don't have hundreds and hundreds of people knocking on our border every day like we do in Europe. Um, the effects would be very evident here in how effective this is. And so, I've just said lastly, let's do what we can to see this happen. Thank you.